Alright folks, here we're going to talk a little bit about soils, soil formation. Uh, but just to remind you, I know we discussed this before, we have two different types of weathering. We have physical weathering and chemical weathering. And physical weathering uh, basically is the process of making little rocks out of big rocks. And these processes include such things as wedging, frost wedging, that's a big one. Uh, unloading, as we see this uh, granite here. Now it doesn't have the weight from being buried on it. It's, it's slowly expanding. Uh, biological activity can, you know, destroy rocks as well. And then, of course, collisions of grain in a current. Chemical weathering, on the other hand, is the process that, you know, a chemical reactions breaks down the internal structure and components of minerals and involves interactions between, you know, air, water, carbon dioxide, yada, yada, and the, the minerals themselves. Right? And this, of course, produces ions, but it also produces altered mineral products, by which I mean are clays. Right? Now, working together to form soils are chemical and physical weathering. Physical weathering, making little rocks out of big rocks. Right? Quartz is one of these that's very stable, uh, doesn't chemically react with very much. Uh, so this just gets kind of broken down smaller and smaller bits, eventually the smallest size being, being uh, silt size grains so we can go all the way from you know big quartz chunks down to, to silt sized grains but these end up becoming concentrated in the soil because they're chemically inert they don't they don't react much right aluminum is another one that becomes concentrated in the soils for the same reason aluminum is very inert it doesn't react much so uh as other things weather and and uh, erode away uh the the quartz and the aluminum become concentrated Again, chemical weathering adds to this by making ions and altered mineral products, by which I mean our clays. And a lot of different minerals weather into clays pretty rapidly. Feldspars, these will go into clays really quickly. Ferromagnesian minerals, biotite, hornblende, those kind of things. Those will turn into clays very easily as well. Uh, and then as you know, it releases this clay, it's also going to release those ions. Sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, etc. Right? Uh, and then these are easily carried away by water. They're called mobile elements if they like to travel in water. Iron is also a mobile element. It likes being in water, but even more than being in water, it loves oxygen. And whenever it finds free oxygen, it's going to join together, create an iron oxide mineral. Uh, and this is, you know, hematite, magnetite, stuff like that, limonite. Uh, and this is going to create your, your red or yellowish colors in our soil. So both chemical and physical weathering add to our soils. Now, climate is also very important when we're talking soils. Uh, physical and chemical weathering are both affected by climate. For physical weathering, presence of water is important. We we'll find that's for chemical weathering as well. But here, temperature, we want it to be cold, right? So why? Because this is what gives us the freeze-thaw action, that, that wedging, the frost wedging, right? Water seeps down into cracks, it expands, and breaks the rock apart. That's a huge part of physical weathering. So wherever we have, you know, presence of water and cold climates, we're going to have lots of physical weathering. Chemical weathering, same thing, presence of water, very important for those chemical reactions. However, temperature is important too, but now the warmer it is, the more weathering because chemical reactions, not only does water aid those processes, but heat speeds up those chemical reactions as well. So strong chemical weathering happens when you got lots of rain and heat. Strong physical weathering occurs when you have uh, uh, stills, you know, some moisture, but, but, you know, that kind of freeze thaw, colder temperatures. And then, uh, you know, very little weathering happens if, you know, there's, there's no water. So whether, you know, in an Ar Antarctic desert or, you know, an Arctic tundra or, or like, you know, Mediterranean or, or, you know, something like that, um, uh, you get very little weathering of any kind. However, it's important to note that all weathering creates more surface area Right, so you break a rock apart. Now, as more surface area, you dissolve a bunch of, you know, chemical or uh, um, minerals into into clay and ions. It increases their surface area. This gives more sites for chemical and physical weathering to occur. So the process of weathering speeds up the process of weathering. Right. When we look at soils, a few things we need to define here. First of all, soils any uh, loose material on Earth's surface 
capable of supporting life, it's capable of supporting plant life. It's a very important distinction. Regolith, on the other hand, is material that has weathered in place. Not necessarily that it supports life, but it's material that is weathered in place. Sediment, on the other hand, is, is weathered material that has been eroded and then transported and redeposited. Looking at the different horizons of soils, we go from, obviously, somebody, when they named these, they went from the top, they went A, B, C down below, and then somebody else decided, oh, we needed more layers like O and E. Uh, but this is not the order that they form in, right? So soil horizons or different layers of soil are what we're looking at here. And they develop due to continued weathering throughout the profile of the of the ground. So as the soil matures and develops, right, we get more and more of these different horizons. Uh, it develops due to downward transportation of materials due to water and gravity. The very first horizon to form is the sea horizon. It forms right on top of the parent material, whether it be bedrock or not. It forms from that and essentially is our regolith. Right? Not necessarily uh, supporting of life, but just material that has weathered in place. The next one to form is the A horizon. As this becomes an actual soil and can support plant life, uh, some of those minerals are starting to break down and release ions. Now plants can start to form on it when we get our second horizon, the A horizon or topsoil horizon, which is where all those things are living and you know dying and, and all that good stuff. It's a very organic rich horizon, of course, you know, we want good topsoil to grow stuff. And then the B horizon forms, this one in the middle here. Um, this is our zone of accumulation. So things that like clays, iron, aluminum, quartz, they're gonna, you know, kind of concentrate in the subsoil as as moisture starts to, you know, and gravity starts to bring down uh, them from above, they'll start to accumulate in this area. It forms later than the A and the C horizons, takes a little bit longer time, um, uh, but you will get accumulation, you know, and then, of course, long, long periods of accumulation, we can go and mine them for things like aluminum and iron. Sometimes you will get an E horizon. This will only happen if you have very, very well-drained soil. Uh, very old, well-drained soil, and this is the leach zone of leaching. So, if this is a zone of accumulation, this is where the the stuff has been leached from, and basically you're just left with you know sand and and, and silt basically in there. And then we have the O horizon. These are like you know the muck fields in Hudsonville. You see that big you know that dark black dirt. Those are O horizon. That's you know this kind of anoxic, dead and dying organic matter that lives on the top. And these are basically our soil horizons. So while they're kind of, you know, A, B, C to the bottom with E and O thrown in there, um, that's not the order they form. They form C, A, B, right? So C is first, then A, then the B horizon. Now, some factors of formation, right? Obviously, what does the C horizon look like? Uh, it doesn't have to be bedrock, right? Here in Michigan, we're not developing a lot of our soils on bedrock. We're developing them on glacial till, which is a loose kind of unconsolidated sediment. However, if we develop them from a bedrock, like a limestone or a granite, it's going to be called a residual soil. And obviously, the chemistry and physics of the, uh, the you know, the, the what you're in or what you're making the soil out of that parent material is going to have a big impact on you know, your different types of soils. Organisms are going to have a big uh, impact as well. They mix the soil. It's called bioturbation. They help break down the materials, which allows oxygen to enter the soil. And they also produce organic matter, eating, breathing, pooping, dying, uh, all in the soil adds to the organic matter. So looking at kind of, you know, some more factors. Again, we talk climate, temperature, and rainfall importance. Uh, the abundance and diversity of organisms is important because it's going to help recycle nutrients as well. Uh, mild temperatures, adequate rainfall, you'll get a rich topsoil horizon like we have in much of our Midwest United States. And very warm and very humid, excessively leached soils like we get in our tropics. This is where we're going to get our, our bauxite, which is our, our, our ore for aluminum uh, and, and kaolinite, some other sort of clays and stuff there. Right? So really, just to start developing a soil profile, a soil horizons, just to get you know those first two, C and A, 
Yeah, you can maybe do it in a hundred years or less, right? But to make, you know, kind of an ABC horizon, it's going to take several hundred years. Deeply weathered soils, you know, more than 10,000 10, years. And then those intensely weathered tropical soils, which are known as oxisols, one of the few soil names I'd like you to know. Uh, these are well over 100,000 years that they take to form before we can, you know, finally uh, 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 mine um, the... the um, uh, bauxite and such out of them right so the idea we should be getting here is that soil is a non-renewable resource at least on you know our human type time scale right? another term paleosol the paleo means old soil means soil this is just an ancient buried soil I use these a lot in my research to help uh, determine what's been going on in the environment there's two ways we have of classifying soil. First is the soil science classification that's going to be used by environmental scientists, basically. Uh, we look at the characteristics of these horizons, the temperature and moisture regime, or aka the climate. Uh, we can break these up into 12 major categories. I don't really care that you know any of these, except that oxisols are those highly weathered tropical soils uh, and where we can get our aluminum ore from. Then there's the engineering classification. And this is based on the different properties of soils. Basically, how amount of sand, silt, and clay kind of starts off the basis of the classification. And then we can look at other things like strength and compressibility and such like that. And of course, this is what we're concerned about if you're trying to build something on uh, the soil. Right. So here's this kind of three-way classification chart. The way we classify soils are then, you know, clay, silt, sand, percent of each. All right. So if you have 100% sand or 90% or more, it's just called a sand. You get basically 50% or more, we call it just a clay. What we like to see in our, in our farm fields are these loams, these kind of nice mixtures of sands, silts, and clays all together. That's going to give us a good, well-drained, very nutrient-rich soil to grow. All right, folks, hope you enjoyed this.